Hello, everybody. Welcome to the event tonight. My name is Brian Nitzel, uh, co-founder of Renovus. We're so happy that you're joining us tonight for the concert. Uh, Renovus. Uh, some of you know what Renovus is and some of you don't. So uh, Renovus is uh, Latin and it means to renew and to renovate, to restore and make things right. And so as, as an organization, we believe that no one should have to choose between their relationship with Jesus and their sexual and gender orientation. So we help LGBTQ individuals rediscover and reclaim that faith and community. We're an Atlanta-based organization. We've been around for about a year. We're about 400 strong. Uh, we connect folks through events like this. Um, we also, the, really the life of our group is, uh, of our organization, our weekly home groups, they're all remote now, and but still thriving, thankfully. And we also help uh, refer people to trusted resources and organizations that serve LGBTQ individuals and their families and their friends. And we're slowly expanding beyond Atlanta. So that's Renovus. And if you want to learn more about our organization and see how you can connect or partner with us, you can check us out uh, online at renovus.org. So the concert series, we'll get to tonight's event shortly, but just, uh, just so you know about the concert series, this is, our, this is our third installation of the virtual concert series for Renovus. Uh, to introduce new people to our organization. Uh, we, uh, we've been inviting, uh, we've had, I think, seven total artists, five shows, all successful artists who are allies and friends of the LGBTQ community and that they believe in Renovus and our mission and we believe in them. Uh, each of these artists are compelling and they bring music and a message that's, that's relevant and excellent. Um, the shows have been great so far. We have two shows coming up uh, at the end of September, the last two Sundays. Uh, on September 20th, we have Sarah Groves. Uh, that's a familiar name to Christian music followers, of course. Uh, she has uh, 15 records to date, a Dove Award nominee for Best New Artist. Uh, CCM Magazine has called her Artist and or Album of the Year a couple of times. Uh, but apart from her artistry, she's also a real advocate for justice. She does great work with the International Justice Mission that you may be familiar with. So I reached out to her uh, uh, and her uh, and her uh, manager, and they were very enthusiastic about our organization and our mission and, and thrilled to join our concert series. So that's Sarah. And then on September 27th, we're having David Wilcox, uh, an iconic folk pop artist with a really big following uh, regionally and nationally. Uh, also a real clear passion for justice and for our community. Uh, so much wisdom in his songs and stories. Uh, so if you're not familiar with David, that's a real treat for you. I reached out to their management as well and presented our organization and same thing. They just love what we're doing and we're thrilled to be a part of the concert series. So you can check out David uh, or Sarah uh, at the event page at renovus.org. Okay, so for a little housekeeping for tonight, this is a very new venture you know, live streaming concert, a couple locations. So thankfully my buddy Andy Revis is behind the scenes kind of dialing everything in. So I'm sure we'll have it all go off without a hitch, but if there's any technical difficulties, just be patient with us and we'll get it figured out. Uh, the flow of the night, uh, pretty soon I'm gonna introduce our featured artist of the night, Stacy Frenis. She's gonna come on and sing for about 45 minutes or 50 minutes or so. Um, and then stick around after that, cause she's gonna, then I'm gonna come back on the screen and we're gonna do a little meet and greet and, and, and get to know Stacy's heart uh, as an artist and as a mother. And she has an amazing story about how, uh, about how her daughter coming out has really changed her heart and her mind about what it means to love well. So it'd be a really good Q and A with her as well. Um, so we'll do that and we'll probably wrap up by about 8.30 tonight. So that's how it'll go, or 8.30 Eastern time. Sorry, people are all over the place. 8.30 Eastern time, about an hour and a half from now. Uh, a couple other housekeeping items. If you're not familiar with watching a live video on YouTube, you can actually rewind. So if you lose connection or you step away, there's a little red dot or a scrubber at the bottom of your screen. You can back it up and rewind. So that's good to know. There's also a chat feature on the right side of your screen, I'm not sure which, to your right, whichever way, I don't know if I'm pointing the right way. Uh, there's a chat feature there that during the show you can chat to folks, uh, but also real important in the Q&A uh, because you can feed questions uh, to Stacy uh, uh, that, that, that are on your heart to learn from her experience to relate with yours. So I, there is a trick in that I think you have to be logged into Google or YouTube to use the chat feature, so you might need to do that quick, um, but that's the chat feature. And then finally for supporting Stacy. 
this is her job, this is her living. So there's a couple of ways that you can support her as an artist. Uh, first of all, she has many uh, CDs and records that she's made and you can check out our music at our website online. You can just search her, stacyfrenis.com. But also tonight we've set up a tip jar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you'll see it. Uh, if you're in full view, you might have to toggle out of the full view, but if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a tip jar that we've set up for Stacy. You can click on that, it's just a PayPal, uh, and that money will go directly to support Stacy. So that's it for housekeeping. So why don't we bring in the guest of the evening, Stacy Frenis. There she is, Stacy. I love when the technology works. Okay, we're over the first hurdle. <laughs> I love it. So Stacy, 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 thank you, thank you for joining us. We're, we're longtime friends. Um, actually artistic collaborators. We've done some songwriting together, which is great. I think I met you in 2007. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. I think so. We got connected from mutual artists and, but we have a long time, but apart from the artistic collaboration, we've stayed near and dear friends for lots of reasons. So yes. it's been really fun to be a part of your musical and personal journey. I'm really, really thrilled that you joined us tonight. Let me brag on you for a minute and then I'll let you take it away, okay? So Stacey Prentice, everybody, eight recordings to date. She's had songs featured on major television shows, but even what's more compelling about Stacey is her story. And, and you'll hear more about that through her songs and at the Q&A at the end. Uh, we might have a little surprise at the end. So I hear that your Possibly. daughter, Abby, may be in the house. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So Abby's a big part of her story and a phenomenal musician herself. So towards the end, Abby's going to join the show, which is great. Uh, and then also another deal, um, major book release early next year called Love Makes Room, which is you kind of writing your story. Super excited about that and just think you're going to love Stacy. She's a big mama bear advocate for our community, but also for conservative parents and families of LGBTQ individuals. So there's my Stacy commercial. <laughs> you want to take it away and then I'll see you on the backside, all right? Sounds good, Brian. Love you. All right, love you. Your love is liquid, filling the hollow spaces. I can feel you moving inside 
everything you love comes alive. I know you're clapping out there. I can hear you in my heart. I can hear you. Um, it's so good to be here, actually, with, with all of you um, tonight. I know that I can't see you, but I can feel you, and I know you're there, and it feels just good to gather and to be together. Um, I thought I'd start with that song, Everything You Love Comes Alive, and um, because I wanted to let you know that I am alive right now. Um, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm still alive and kicking. My family has been sheltering in place all these months, and then, um, let's see, last month, during the month of July, three of the four of us here in the house actually did end up getting um, the coronavirus, and it was a... It was just a, a, a crazy kind of isolation within the isolation, within, 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 you know. We, we ended up having to kind of just lay really low and get better. But thank the Lord, no one had to be hospitalized. No one had trouble breathing. No one needed medication um, beyond some Tylenol. And we're all better. We're up and at it. We are doing well. And so um, we're alive. Very grateful for that. Um, so... Yeah, it's been a kind of a, a nutty time, hasn't it? Um, I, how are you all? Are you all doing okay out there? It's a strange um, time to be alive. We, I keep saying that sort of to different people and thinking it's one of those times in history where we keep looking back and, and saying, who would have thought we would be doing this? Or who would have thought, you know, last year this time we'd be doing this right now? And... Um, and yeah, and yet change, right? Change seems to be sort of the constant, the constant name of the game right now. Um, we've been just sort of adapting um, in all kinds of big ways and, and in little ways. For example, um, I've been wearing yoga pants for five months straight, but I put on jeans tonight for you, just for you guys, with real buttons, and it is a sacrifice, I'm telling you right now. Um, but, yeah, weird things like that, just kind of like, you know, all these virtual meetings and that kind of thing. And yet, uh, I feel like adapting is kind of part of the, the, human, the human experience, right, of just as we, as we change from season to season. So this is um, kind of no different, uh, although very different. I want to sing a song uh, called unpathed waters undreamed shores because it's well it's reminding me tonight that we are all of us on really undreamed shores places we never dreamed that we would be um you know like i said last time uh, this time last year and yet um even as we sort of pass through these different waters um we see change and growth in all of us Change is a river and it keeps on rolling You never get to where you think you're going Yeah, yeah You're carried by the current of a heartbeat pulsing It's a mystery how you're becoming you One move at a time And on it goes Stay where it's safe and shallow I hear the call from the deep and follow 
you got one life Don't be afraid of reaching unpath waters The best places are the ones you discover One chance at a time Thank you. <laughs> there are actually two people behind the camera that are clapping for me. <laughs> two, two loud people that love me very, very much. So, um, so uh, yeah, you know, it's been kind of a, a joke among some of my friends when the um, when the the pandemic got started that I was getting some texts and phone calls saying like, "Did you wish this on us? Because you've got this crazy song about wishing people storms, and this is the biggest storm ever." And and, um, you know, I, I think about the fact that uh, for a couple of years I've sung this next song so many times and, and told stories about how I've, you know, wished my friends and family storms when they're going through tough times because I think that in some ways, you know, those undreamed shores that we reach, we can never reach those shores unless sometimes storms move us to those places. If you know me at all, you know that I love water metaphors. And this, this year just has been kind of, um, well, a wash in water metaphor, metaphors, if you will. Um, and so this next song just has felt kind of prophetic for me uh, during this season in that, um, you know, when, I think when it, it became clear that all of us really, our lives were changing for, in such dramatic ways, um, you know, it seemed like we sort of, hit these hit these places where we were either really fighting it and really struggling against it or we were moving with those currents of change and with those really um, challenging waters um, and so I would encourage you tonight just if you are in one of those tough places with this current season to to see it as a yes a storm but also a, a storm that moves you into a new season i think that uh, you know in my heart i know i've been really praying that that this difficult time would also bring with it treasures and gifts um, from deep deep places that i can't get to any other way and um, so this is a song i originally actually wrote for my kids um, I have two children, and this was a song I wrote to sort of, um, you know, counter the mother's intuition in me that wanted to keep them safe at all times. And I realized that, you know, keeping 
kids or keeping anyone safe doesn't really do them any favors. It doesn't develop in them the, the very traits that you need to be resilient and brave and compassionate and all the things we want to be. So um, I'm going to sing this song, Storms, because it really does feel like we're kind of in the mother of all storms right now, but I think there's things to be learned from it. So. Everybody wishes you the sunshine Like it's magic, some kind of wonder drug Everybody wishes you those blue skies Like being happy is good enough My love, I wish you more I wish you storms tries to stay protected from the dangers of this uncharted life but beauty is never where you expect and in the ruins treasures hide and so my love be warned I wish you storm to uh, ask my guitar tech to come and tune my guitar for a second because I'm super connected like that. Um, yes, so I wanted to tell you a little story tonight because um, I know that I'm among such good friends and folks that understand this this world, many folks who understand this world way better than I do. I remember the first night I visited um, gosh, Brian's loft, and we did a house concert for this growing new community of LGBTQ folks and some parents uh, and loved ones and allies and friends, and, and it was one of the first times I actually told this story about my daughter coming out and, and just how it had shifted and, and, and broke my heart open, and um, it was just an amazing night where I stood in a room full of people who I knew all of whom I knew had stories to tell that were every bit as um, 
life-changing and sometimes heartbreaking and um, yeah, faith shifting <laughs> as mine. And um, I was honored and felt privileged and felt really just wrapped in all of your arms of love that night. Um, our, our daughter came out to us when she was 16 years old. She came out um, really in, in high school and she was, um, we were driving to school and she started crying and was in the middle of, un unbeknownst to me, she was in the middle of a breakup with a girl. And um, I remember just pulling the car over and just, both of us, just sobbing. <laughs> and, um, you know, for some people, I know that that news, hearing that news would not be really even a blip on their on their radar. But for um, for me, it was a story that, or it was a, it was kind of just news that sort of seeped into these deep places in my heart that really had n no idea what to do with it. Um, I was born and raised in a conservative Christian home, and I married somebody from the same kind of faith background and raised our kids the same way in a, actually Assembly of God was our background church. And um, so there just didn't seem to be a framework in which to really fit this news that I had a daughter who was gay, and um, I just remember thinking, even just in that initial conversation, that something was going to give, something had to give, because the very, the very narrow and limited framework that I grew up with around that concept um, was not going to fit alongside the, the love that I had in my heart for this child that... Um, that was my own. And so the, I knew even early on that, that, that room had to be made, that, that there was going to have to be some things that were going to have to go. And uh, I didn't know what that looked like yet, but I knew I was going to have to make some room um, for changes in my heart early on. And I remember this song being um, one of the first songs I wrote way back when, when my heart was just still kind of trying to figure this out, that, um, yeah, what, what is this going to look like moving forward? I'm clearing out the cobwebs. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. It's, we've got this, though, you guys. We are pros right now. This is good. <laughs> All right. Now you should turn my guitar, right? I'm clearing out the cobwebs. I'm sorting through the dusty boxes. Removing all the clutter from inside these halls. I'm opening the locked rooms Making a way for you to walk through Quiet in the chaos crashing through Through these walls A few things can remain But most of it's gotta go Pictures have hung around too long, like fixtures, reminding me of who I was. Those vain, empty years. It's time for saying goodbye. I got no place in my life for those tired, worn out, useless souvenirs. can remain but most of it's gotta go It all belongs 
close to you, you're welcome here. Anytime it's your home, I don't want to walk these halls alone. So I'm making followed I think you know part of that song sounds kind of like and she made room and things worked out great but I have to tell you that it, it was a process um, for months especially and then even years to make room for some of the new ways of thinking um, about something that I had grown up with in my faith tradition as thinking about one way and not only that as someone who grew up in the 80s and 90s and had very few if not any gay friends that to really until I was in my 30s and almost 40s um, it was it really took some kind of opening my heart and making room for new conversations um, it opening my heart making room for um, really biblical scholarship that I had not really dug into or read much around it also meant making room in our family for just talking about things, having awkward conversations with my daughter about what it was like to be gay. And um, sometimes those ended up being humorous. Sometimes they ended up being weird conversations because she would, you know, a lot of times look at me like, really, Mom, you're asking that question again or you're asking that particular question? Or, But the truth is I, I had a teenager in my house that I still needed to raise as a mom but also – try and understand and kind of walk alongside as well um, I as I was learning new ways of thinking about it and yeah I can remember one of the also making room for laughter and for humor um, one of the ways I can remember just <laughs> getting everything wrong was in just the language you know um, the words the letters LGBTQ at, when they first came out of my mouth they just sounded so awkward and jumbled and so my husband and I were, would try to get it right and inevitably especially my husband would sort of trip over the words and it would end up coming out somehow the letters BLT always stuck together and so it ended up to just be like whenever we referred to the LGBTQ to me oh Okay, there I go. The LGBTQ community ended up sounding like the BLT community whenever it came out of my husband's mouth. And I'm sorry to say it just kind of stuck. You know, we, we ended up just calling them the BLTs. So we love the BLTs with all our hearts. It just, just know that it was, it's been a learning curve on many fronts. Um, um, so I'm trying to read that little note, when, especially when I'm on. Okay, and just got to know that I need to get a little closer to the mic. Um, so... One of the ways in which I was learning to make room as well is with uh, my fellow Christian friends because <clears throat> as my heart was growing and my heart was beginning to just make room and understand some of the um, some of the aspects of what it meant to love my daughter and to understand her um, sexual orientation just in the context of being made in the image of God as beautiful, as wonderful, as perfect. Um, I, I understood that some of my Christian friends were in different places with that whole kind of paradigm. And it got to be where sometimes conversations with friends be, 
became kind of landmines, you know. They felt, they felt like they'd be safe up to a point, and then um, certain things would get said that I, I knew were not any, were not going to go any further from that point because there was just this really um, difficult barrier to cross in terms of how I was beginning to understand and view my daughter and how I knew others, uh, some of my Christian friends did. And I remember around 2015 when the Supreme Court, um, you know, made legal the gay marriage, um, boy, I, I can remember Facebook just kind of blowing up with comment threads from Christians and non-Christians and kind of just everyone in between with what their opinions were and um, around the whole subject. And it was so touchy and so divisive. Um, can you imagine a country that's divisive and that fights on Facebook? And I know, sounds crazy, but yeah, there it was. Um, and and I mean, and that's why I, I kind of want to sing this song too. It's a song that feels so timely right now. Um, I ended up feeling like I was coming into some of those conversations like arming up, you know, getting my armor on, you know, like I, getting my Bible verses ready or getting my opinions ready or getting my arguments ready. When in reality, I think um, a lot of us were missing the point. We were trying to win fights or win arguments um, instead of, I don't know, love each other. And I, I, I remember just feeling so, um, just feeling so impressed that, that in these conversations, if we, if we just could let love have the last word, rather than always fighting ourselves for the last word, that, um, that we could make so much progress in, in having conversations that are hard and in which we have a lot of disagreements. Um, so I, I thought I would share this song, Disarm. It's one, of, it's one of the ones that came out of conversations with my daughter, as well as conversations with other Christians. How many rounds must we go? Trust and just be who 
I think probably one of the last, um, one of the last big spaces I needed to make room for was really um, the, the theology piece. And it was um, something I really didn't even know how to address just because I had, like I said, grown up in a church that had only ever talked about um, being gay in, in very narrow um, terms. And it, was, uh, it wasn't, wasn't working anymore with what the reality was in front of me. I knew that there was something wrong with, with what I had been taught, with what I had absorbed all those years in church. And yet I didn't really know how to point a finger to a specific verse and say, ah, here it is. Here's the reason why I believe what I do. It was more like a, a deep knowing in me. Um, but I was determined to set on a path to understand better what I believed and why I believed it. And I, I still wanted to believe that, that, that the Bible was a place that I could find God's word and his wisdom and, and his heart. And, and I could find um, proof of how God react, uh, interacted with his people and for his people. And so I, I did. I studied for months and months and even years and um, just found my way through the handful of verses that mention homosexuality and discovered in them um, some pretty poorly translated words, actually, that, that um, ended up, as I in hindsight understood, were used to be weaponized and, and not really fully understood in context of the culture, of the language. Um, but an even broader look as I stepped back, I, I wanted to see in Jesus and I wanted to see in God's heart just exactly where to land in all of this. And the more I studied Jesus, the more I looked at how he acted and how he interacted with people, um, I saw that Jesus' heart was so much for healing and restoration and redemption and inclusion and um you know his he would always chase after the one and leave the 99 i mean that i feel like that theme comes up over and over um in jesus's heart as he deals with people and he doesn't seem to be there to judge he seems to be there to love and to include and as I looked even further back at all of scripture, really from Genesis to Revelation, you know, just kind of that whole huge arc, the narrative arc of scripture seems to say that God is for us, that it is love that first be begat, begot <laughs> all of us, and it's love that finally embraces us when we go home, and that that is the really the sort of the scarlet thread that runs throughout scripture um, is God's great love for each of us. Um, and I realized that if God's love can be that forgiving and redeeming and, and absolutely all embracing um, and affirming of all of us, um, then absolutely uh, I could 100% believe in a God that welcomed and affirmed and loved and embraced everything about my daughter and that he created her as good and perfect. Um, and, you know, it's almost like my theology had to catch up with that deeper knowing that I kind of call my mother's intuition or that deep, deep love that always knew, always knew. And if I, and if, if a mother's love knows, then surely God's love wants the best, wants our, our children to flourish and to love and to be loved and to know that they are welcome and included at this table um, that we call faith. Um, so I'm going to end. I'm going to end with a song, and then I have really a cool surprise for you. And that is, my daughter's going to come and sing a couple of songs. So you get to put a beautiful face to the story. Um, so this is, this song is a brand new one for me, and I know a lot of you are going, "Well, all your songs are new," but this is new to me, which means only just means I'm going to probably mess up more than I did before in the other songs. But it is a song that, in in many ways, sums up what my theology is around this whole topic. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called The Story of Us. I'm going to take a quick drink of water here. All right. In the beginning, it was love, creating everything, dreaming you and me, spirit breathing into us. Beauty of who we are, of the image of God, and we've never, ever, not once, been 
separated from this love It's written in the stars above, it's tattooed on our hearts It's running through our veins like blood, it's singing who we are Even when we don't believe the story of us Love us, love us, love us Sure as a sunrise, older than time Love was choosing us, wooing us Forever on our side Sees us as we are, says we're beautiful And we've never, ever, not once Been separated from this love in the stars above, it's tattooed on our hearts It's running through our veins like blood, it's singing who we are Even when we don't believe the story of us Love does, love does Even when we start to give up Love's not giving up on us Even when our own heart fails us love won't fail us love won't fail us love won't fail it's written in the stars above it's tattooed on our hearts it's running through our veins like blood it's singing who we are and when we don't believe the story of us love does love does Written in our destiny, it's branded on our souls Hidden in our deepest dreams, it's how we are known And when no one else will tell the story of us Love does, love does, ooh, love does, love does Cause the story, the story of us Is the story, the story of love Right. Thanks, everybody. And um, here's Abby. <laughs> Crazy. So many people I can't see. Um, hi, I'm Abby. I'm the daughter of Stacy Frenis. Um, we obviously have very different stories, um, very different perspectives. Um, and I think because this is, you know, primarily an LGBT group, um, a lot of people know what it's like wherever you are in your faith, whether you're, you know, whether you were a believer before or have found, um, you know, some some peace and and comfort in finding your faith now after, you know, I think that there's a lot of um, deconstruction of who you are, what you believe in, and um, how to kind of exist in the world when you have to break apart all of those structures, whether it's society, religion, yourself, your family dynamic, it's, it's a whole thing. And um, yeah, so this first song that um, I'm gonna play was during a time that, oh, I should probably tune this, it's in a different tuning. Um, <laughs> it was during a time that um, I kind of, was not with my family and I was with um, somebody who I kind of replaced as my home for some time, but it was a very, very unhealthy um, situation. And I think that this was kind of like the catalyst for me kind of returning back to the heart of, um, I don't know, innocence and finding my worth and finding my my place after kind of taking um, a really good amount of time away from my faith um, and figuring out what that meant. So anyway, this is that song. It's been a while since I've played it.
mom and dad <laughs> uh, let's see uh, well first of all thank you guys so much for having me um, it really is an honor to be able to perform with my mom and really be talking about some of these issues I think it's really important in the space that we're in especially like everything that's going on in the world it's been absolutely crazy and so um, yeah making room for these conversations however hard they are however difficult they are um i think it's just so meaningful and also can we take a moment to admire how hard it is to tune and make conversations <laughs> okay um we are going up okay my mom is obviously the pro i'm just the little baby okay so this next song is um is a song called Fickle and Hollow. It was on um the last EP that I released and to me it's kind of about um really facing your own your own darkness and your own demons and your own shame and um really taking a critical look at the way that you love and the way that you show up for the people that you love. Um I think that part of why this song means so much to me is like I think that um there's this line in it it's it's if we stayed right where we are we would grow hollow and I and I really believe that I really believe that if you don't lean into the discomfort and really provide compassion you know without defending your suffering um but really accepting it and leaning into it and and learning how to be better and grow it's really important in our relationships that we have with people with ourselves and I think the relationship that we have with with God or spirituality I think that you know keeping that growth mindset is what makes our suffering and our you know hard journeys really worth it and it really brings a lot of purpose to the things that we do so um, yeah so this is the last song I'll be doing and then I think we'll be doing a Q&A we'll chat for a second so this is uh, Fickle and Hollow. She told me I was wrong No love is great if it's 
fickle and hollow And knew once I was at a loss Nobody has shown me the defects of my heart before you ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. If we stay right where we are, right where we are We will grow Well, I know right from the start, right from the start That I was not fickle and hollow Fickle and hollow You settled down again Another easy love you never wanted to let in ooh, ooh, ooh. As long as you were never alone ooh, ooh, ooh. Cause you stay right where you are, right where you are and I grew hollow I chose to stay instead of fight And what she got, yeah, what she got was fickle and hollow Fickle and hollow Mom and dad are giving you a standing O, but I give you one. They are. They're doing like silent claps. <laughs> That's awesome. Abby, it's so freaky. I've heard about you for all this time and I've never, well, I've seen your face like online and music and stuff, but yeah, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, it's good to meet you too. My mom has told me so many things about just the experiences that she's had with like uh, this group and with you specifically and all the cool conversations that have been had. So it's good to find yeah. out face to a name. And it was just crazy because I met your mom in 2007 and it, we don't need to get into my story, but I, it took me a long time to know that Jesus was thumbs up about me being gay, right? <laughs> a long time. And so your mom knew me when I still wasn't sure about that. And she saw me when I was awkwardly coming into that new place where God was saying, hey, you know what? Like, we're good here. We're good here. And, and, and you, you were in the middle of all of that, Stacey. It's crazy. I just remember that when Abby was singing and crazy. So, yeah. Well, it's good to really, really, really good to see stories, you. right, Brian? Yeah, totally. Totally. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you, you guys. Um, we're gonna switch into a little Q and A here. Before I do that, if you want to, you know, in case you're no one's dropping off, it's so cute. Like I'm looking on YouTube here, and like not one person has dropped. So apparently we're doing something right here. <laughs> um, Abby but, needs to but, keep but, singing. That's what I, that's what I think. I know, I know, but in case you, in case you do, just know 
Stacy Frenis, Abby Frenis. You can find them online. You both have Facebook artist pages, so that's a great place mm -hmm. to get a little bit of the story. You, all, you both have websites. Abby, your website's a little more of a composite of sort of like your graphic yeah. video work as well as your music, right? So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so you can find these guys online and stuff. Um, but yeah, let's switch into a little Q&A. Um, and if you want to submit questions, so I've got my little phone right next to me. So if you chat in some questions that you have for either Stacy or Abby, I'll keep track of them here and, and feed those questions to these guys as long as they're not, I won't feed you any hardballs, guys, don't worry. <laughs> um, but I would love to, um, like before we dive into the story, like let's first let's talk about your music. I find that just so fascinating, compelling, is that you both have the heart of an artist, you know. And so, um, what's when did that start coming alive for you, Abby? The, the music, the artistry thing. What are your what's your calling there? What are your aspirations there? What do you think about with music? What do you want to do with it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think naturally, like growing up with my parents playing music all the time, like I just kind of grew up, you know tripping over chords <laughs> during sound yeah, check yeah. and stuff like that so like I mean it had to have been like way over 10 years ago now at this point that like I wrote my first song and my mom actually wrote the guitar for it and I kind of sang over it but I started getting really into like you know recording and sort of like orchestrating my own songs from the get-go so mm -hmm. my love for it has been like you know, teetering the line of, I don't know, I like things really cinematic. So I started, you know, like taking photos for it. And, and that kind of like bled into what I do now as a career, which is like videography and photography. And I used to work with a lot of artists because I think that yeah. there's something so beautiful about supporting other people through their journey. So, I mean, for me, like music, I still feel like I could still really dive in more. Um, but I've been able to, I've been able to do some amazing things like tour in France. That was incredible. Um, with the last EP that I released, Fickle and Hollow. Um, but yeah, I think it's just one of those things that is so deeply rooted in who I am, the creative process from start to finish, whether it's music yeah. or film or, you know, photos. I think that there's just something sort of innate, um, that just needs to create and i think that a lot of that definitely came from growing up in a creative household i love that you're sort of a um i promised to ask you a question eventually stacy i've just never had abby time um but you have like <laughs> you're sort of like this renaissance artist which is cool because a lot yeah. of people like have their singing gig and then they're like an accountant over here to pay the bills where at least you sure. found a way in your early life to find you know sources of income from all things creative which is super cool yeah yeah, definitely. It's been, yeah. it's been cool. It's been interesting to, you know, move around the different industries, but yeah, yeah. it's been fun. And then how about you, Stacy, with your music? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Talk about what yeah. you've done, but also looking ahead, you know, is it shifting more to writing or is it still a both music and writing? What do you think? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I feel like it's it was fun listening to Abby talk about how she and how because I know that to be true about her. Like she in she envisions the whole song when she writes a song, like not just the the instrumentation and the production, but like she sees the visuals, you know, with her songs. And and I I don't have that experience. I mean, I, I feel like as a songwriter, I'm such a word person. I just I dig deep into the lyrics and then metaphor and and so my love has always kind of been starts with the words, and then that's probably why I've also branched into writing, you know, more writing books and. Um, and and even editing i've been doing some editing as well for some people and so it's it's i guess for me looking forward um i still have music inside of me that wants to come out i actually still um this fall i want to i'm going to launch a new um kickstarter campaign and i'm going to record a new um, ep a brand new songs so the songs are still there which i'm so grateful for and it still seems to be the way that i process the world and pain and joy and beauty um seems to be songs and so as long as those songs keep coming i'll i'll keep writing them and like in the last several years i mean abby's done um, almost all of my um almost all of my visual work. She's done all my videography. Yep. She's done my photography. She's done my last two or three covers, album covers. So yeah. it's just such a joy to have, um, 
to have her be that person that just can kind of step in and do, uh, I mean, anything. She really <laughs> is a Renaissance person. You nailed it. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we got a good question that came in. And by the way, commercial, um, Abby, you did a video for her song, Storms. I did. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really beautiful. So you can check out, um, you can find that online um, at, I don't know where. Oh, I um, put it on the on, on, it's on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, or on just okay. Stacy Frenis. Yeah. So you search one. Stacey Frenis on the YouTube channel, but yep, I remember yeah. that. Okay, we got a, we got questions rolling in. Hold on. Uh, Here we go. Here we go. And I have go, a friend, who, and I have a friend who sent me a text saying, "Quit looking at your phone. You look distracted." I'm watching the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. Look at them when they're talking. All right, hold on. I'll put my phone up here. Um, do Stacy and Abby not do any co-writing? And if if not, um, why not? Hmm. We talk about it all the time. I mean, like we, 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 and we kind of, I feel like we co-write not in the really official sense, but like we're always bouncing ideas off each other. Like yeah. I'll play yeah, a part yeah. of a song and go, what do you think about that? Or mm -hmm. what do you think? And she'll do the same with me. But you know what? It, it's also kind of been something that we've wanted to do for a long time to actually sit down and write songs together. Yeah. So, um, Hey, caller or person, whatever. <laughs> You're right, and we should. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was Nate. That was Nate, by the way. Sorry to call you out, Nate. Nate. Hi, Nate. <laughs> Hi, Nate. <laughs> Nate's a mutual friend of ours who would be the person to ask That's that awesome. question. He's okay, a great producer um, that I would love to work with yes. too. So yeah, let's get this going. Yeah, let's do great. it. Let's do Every it. Artist on the planet. Okay, before we kind of get into your story, because that's where the questions are coming, I want to ask about your book. Do you mind just giving a little, um, this book, Love Makes Room, is coming out. What's sort yeah. of your heart, for, your heart for that, your hope for that? What's that all about? Yeah, I, you know, somewhere around five years ago, I sat down and just started writing the story that tonight that I told in a little kind of nutshell, I wrote, I wrote out the whole story. And um, at first I thought it was just therapy for me, just kind of like processing and, ther you know, kind of the cathartic process of writing it out. And I mean, I would cry and cry as I wrote it chapter after chapter. And then when it got, when it was finished, I realized, you know, there's, and I knew this to be true, that there are a lot of parents who come from really conservative Christian backgrounds who have their kids come out and they, they're, they just, I think, are at a loss as to how to process it, who to talk to, how to kind of walk that path of having their hearts open and changed and under, you know, just kind of to move into that space of a, what it looks like to, to be affirming and, and also to reconcile your faith with, within that. So that's really the, the purpose of that book is to, is to, gosh, almost be like an accidental companion guidebook for other parents to just read, to read it and say, okay, someone else has gone through this story and, um, and this is what it looks like. And I'm not alone in the world, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love that. You, um, a lot of this started. Um, so the timeline here is it was about 10 years ago that you had the cry fest in the car, right? Abby and Stacy. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so it was about and 10 then, years ago that Abby came out. And then about five years ago, I just started kind of just journaling and then it turned into a full blown, blown book. And then, so just at the beginning of this year, the book got picked up by Broadleaf books, which is a major publisher. And, um, and it's going to be it's going to be published released actually um, in, on May in May of 2021. So the spring yep. of next year, it'll be out uh, everywhere. It'll be out. <laughs> That's awesome. So I've got a question for you, but I should not ask my questions because there's a lot of questions rolling in. But I'm just going to ask one, uh, and then I'll go to the questions. But I don't even have my question framed up, so maybe I should go to the better questions. But I. <laughs> You, you wrote something five years ago that was sort of a catalyst for this um, called, uh, it was like a, it was like an editorial of what I learned about love when my daughter came out. I'm assuming it was probably to, to a conservative Christian audience. I, yeah. I, I think I heard the story that like Abby like proofed it or th gave it a thumbs up or whatever. And there was a ton of response to that. And that kind of is what sparked in you. Oh, I wonder if I should keep writing and talking and promoting dialogue oh, about this. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. that was five years ago, right? Yep. 
That's right. And that was the, yeah. it was a blog post I wrote. Um, and then it ended up kind of really going viral. The Huffington Post picked it up and it, it really brought in literally hundreds and hundreds of messages and comments and texts. And again, yes, that's what sparked the whole idea of like, whoa, we're not alone in this. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of people asking these same questions, wrestling with these same um, issues. And so, um, yeah, that thank you for bringing that up because that was definitely a uh, catalyst for the book. Yeah. yeah. And not to put you on the spot, Abby, but I just, I'm curious, like I've heard so much from Stacy, and she even talked about it in the concert a little bit about what she's learned about love from this. Sure. What have you, what have you, what have you learned from this? Like how oh, has gosh. this sort of changed oh, really? your... Uh, have you... Brian, really? <laughs> Are you ready for my I, book? <laughs> oh like, gosh, has I've had... Changed, how has this changed you and your perception of love with your mom or God or whatever? Just go with whatever you want. Yeah, I think that uh, for me particularly, I think that um, coming out is just the beginning. It's not, you know, the sort of like end all, like, okay, I'm out, everything's fine. There's a whole lot of, like I said, deconstruction yep. in a lot of things in your heart and in your soul that, that I, you know, personally had to go through. And so part of what I learned about love when I came out was, you know, not to abandon or um, sacrifice who I was to receive love. Um, because I think that that's something that's really easy to do is to please the people around you to fit into the mold and um, kind of abandon yeah. some really, really important parts of yourself. And so um, I've learned that leaning into the hard conversations and being patient with people who aren't there yet is, is definitely something that we just yep. have to do. We have to be patient yeah. for the people who are gung-ho you know, yep. for, for us and for the people who aren't quite, you haven't quite crossed that bridge yet. You know, we really have to work harder to be advocates um, and, and supporters for people who are still on their journey of, of acceptance. And um, because we, as you yeah. know, members of the LGBT community, we've had to put so much thought and so much work into accepting ourselves that mm -hmm. we really have to be compassionate towards what that looks like for other people who are making room for us. So I, yeah, I, I mean, love, it's, love, love it's that open. you've gotten there. So rewind. <laughs> Rewind 10 to nine years ago when you came out to mom. I'm sure she didn't have this all figured out in six months. What did, what did that patience and awkwardness look like with mom in the early years when she had to kind of turn her paradigm? I mean, I'm sure she always loved you, but yeah. what kind of patience did you have to have with her in the early days? Oh, gosh. Yeah. She writes about something in her book. Uh, it's a great – oh, my gosh. Okay, so, so – for us, it was like, is she a friend or is she a friend or do you like her? As far as like people coming over, having friends, like it was like, okay, mom, my friend's going to stay the night. And mom had to like go through all of these, like, like an interrogation of like, okay, like, are you attracted to her? Is this something that would happen? Because it was like trying to find the line of like being a mom and like, keeping things PG <laughs> and, yeah. and um, you know what yeah. I mean? And like, I don't know, figuring, so that was really awkward and like, it felt like any new friend I had and like, I just, once I was out, it was like, yeah, I love girls. Great. I want to date everyone. So I can only imagine what she went through, like having to meet new people. But um, I think at one point in that conversation, <laughs> Abby said to me, you know, because I said, well, because she would, Abby's very social. And so she would have, you know, friends over all the time. Like, can this person come over and work in homework? Yeah. Can this person, and then can this person spend the night? Because girls always do sleepovers. That's how girl, girls, that's how I grew up. It's like, we always did sleepovers. So I was like, well, then it became this kind of like, wait, what? I can't, wait, what? I can't let this girl sleep over because <laughs> wait, now you like girls. So wait. And then at one point I remember saying to her, well, how do I know, how do I know the difference? And she mm -hmm. said, mom, you're going to have to trust me. Mm -hmm. And it really, I mean, over and over and over, it was really about trust, like trusting each other, yeah. you know, trusting her to be truthful and then her trusting me to not be super, you know, OCD and meddly, meddling yeah. in her life. And, and yeah. just, yeah, we just had to learn balances. And, yeah. And I think like, um, 
it grew and it evolved over time the way that it was uncomfortable and the ways that it weren't yeah. or that it wasn't like, um, you know, as I started having like really long term, like meaningful, um, girlfriends, it was like introducing them to my mom was always like a big thing. Right. And like in the beginning, the first, you know, girl that I'd been with, it was like, kind of taboo like you can obviously feel like what that change looks like you know mm -hmm. when you look at the whole like all of the years that for we've sure. had to spend like really working on demystifying like oh, for sure. everything so yeah. you know like obviously now and you know even even the whole time it was never a lack of acceptance I think it was just like I, like I don't know what to do with this <laughs> for for kind of both of us on how to, yeah, how to yeah. communicate and all that well, that's good. I actually got a question sort of in line with what you're talking about, about this patience thing, whether it's with each other or with other people. I'll read it how it is, and then I'll uh, question for both. When you hear some, someone attack the BLT community, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I sent a text during the show saying, hey, I'm G. I, I want to be a part of the BLT community. <laughs> Thanks, Abe. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the G uh, is one dollar extra. <laughs> it is easier though. We are trying to redeem queer. Are you good with that, Abby, or do you not like it? Oh my goodness! I have a whole passionate monologue on the word queer because. <laughs> I want to hear. It. I well, hear it. I just, I just think that it's, it's a way to honor wherever you fall on the spectrum because I truly believe that sexuality is a spectrum, and it's easy to. To, to put these like barriers like gay, bi, straight, trans, and it's just like we're we are all experiencing these things that are outside of you know the heteronormative world. And I for me, I think queer bleeds into how you identify, you know, because that's a whole nother layer of of your sexuality versus your your gender versus like there are so many things and I just think that queer in the past from what I've heard and this is a conversation that we've also had even recently being uncomfortable like queer is not something that every that everybody I think can hear and be like oh yeah that's great I think there's a lot of trauma attached to it to older generations um, but I love that we are reclaiming it and we are just like really really educating people more on the word queer and I think that I personally identify more as queer than you know just the simple brand of gay or bi I just I think that it's a whole mm. beautiful BLT. thing <laughs> just queer is yeah. the whole BLT queer is the yeah. menu it's the menu <laughs> I love it I love it and my younger as you said older generation folks there's some baggage there but the younger generation people in my life are convincing me and showing me the beauty of that word i'm i'm in i'm anyways yeah, yeah. I'm, so, get, I'm getting there but yeah. yeah so back to the question sorry natalie uh question for both when you hear someone attack the queer community do you take it personally is it a teaching moment or can you walk away and leave it alone That's, um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that changed for me when my daughter came out was that I, I no longer had the luxury of, you know, uh, walking away from those kind of conversations. It's like, um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at that there are, you know, a, a whole world full of advocates who, and allies who haven't had as personal a story as mine to kind of break their heart open and have these conversations. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, it's not one of those things like let's agree to disagree um, on the value and worth of a queer person. That that's to me, that is a conversation that needs to happen because we're not, we're not going to, I'm not ever going to say, yeah, sure. Let's just agree to disagree on that. So in answer to the question, I think maybe, yeah, if, if there is someone who is devaluing or, or, or kind of casting shade on, on the worth of a human being, I think we all need to have that conversation. You know, sometimes we're braver than other times to have those conversations, but, um, but mm -hmm. yeah, need to have them. I, I have a hard time with that question because it's, when you think about context, like, um, 
there are obviously a lot of trolls on the internet, and it's it's different being faced with hate on the internet as it is, or in social media as it is, you know, maybe Person. being in front of somebody who is saying really homophobic slurs or um, really using the Bible as ammunition or or whatever they're using to right. to you know promote hate or disapproval or whatever that may look like. Like, I think that to be an advocate by nature whether you are an ally or you are a member of the LGBT community, there is a certain amount of responsibility that you feel to not, to not just walk away and leave it. But at the same time, it's kind of important to decipher if this person is spending time educating themselves on what it means or, or what it's like for people in that community. Like, I think especially now thinking about like, and this is really hard. I think that there is, I don't think it's right to compare at all um, the Black Lives Matter movement with some of the things that um, the queer community has faced because they are wildly, wildly different. However, it's kind of like that thing where it's like, if you're not educating yourself and actively working towards understanding, um, I, I kind of personally lose, I lose a, a bit of my patience and a bit of my, of my respect, I think. And it's, yep. it's, you know, it's not my job to educate every person who is homophobic or is you know promoting right. that hate so yeah, so it's a fine point. line it's hard it's hard to figure out where to stand but i think that trusting your intuition when that what does when you're faced with that choice is important there was a moment uh and abby i texted you when it was happening uh in the concert where you you had about a two minute sermon there stacy that I was that I was really proud of. Um, I'm very used to in conservative. You and I are similar in that we sort of have one foot in the conservative Christian world and one foot in the LGBT community world, and we sort of have accepted that tension, right? It's kind of part of our, it's part of my calling, and I think it's part of your calling too, which I think is great. Um, and I usually, when I talk to folks on the conservative end of the spectrum. I tend to take the approach of this isn't about a moral dilemma or theology. This is about loving people, right? Yeah. But you really, you really leaned in on your, I've never heard that before, on your process of mm. kind of rethinking the theological context about this as well and thinking that that was not cool. And I, I loved hearing about that. Um, mm. I think that that maybe is more important than I realize. You know, like I always want to get conservative people to just focus on not the moral debate, but on loving, uh, the, wanting healing and wanting to be like Jesus. But I think they're they're both. It sounds like, or at least for you, you embrace both, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, man, there's so much in that. But yeah, the, I didn't really ask the question. Up. Sorry, but I just I yeah, love. No, it's all good. I, I just want to go back and listen to the two minutes because it sounds like you really had a dig in there and I loved it. Well, you'll have to buy my book, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in researching, <laughs> just kidding. In researching like things about theology and homosexuality, which I know that my mom did a lot of when I came out and for this book, yeah. like there was a lot of, um, of etymology involved in deconstructing like the way that, um, what did this word mean back then? Mm -hmm. um, yep. What does it mean in our culture now? Mm -hmm. And really, really breaking that down because she's such a you know word person, word person yeah. literary like English mm -hmm. major. So, um, so there was a lot of like work that had to be done to come to the place where it was like right, like you weren't For abandoning sure. your faith; you were just right. understanding it in a deeper, yes, and more contextual yeah. way. For sure. Yes, what she said. And it makes me think of, so Abby, let me ask you a question. You said the word deconstruct a couple times, and I love that word. And it's a really familiar word in my community of LGBTQ people of faith, that the way that we get over old versions of God and, and hurt is we really have to break down all these rules that don't work for us and rebuild a, a picture of God, not, not of our own liking, but of truth that we can believe in and rally around and reconstruct our faith back to something. 
where I can love Jesus again and get on with my life. So I'm just curious, not to put you on the fence or anything, but that deconstruct, reconstruct for you, what does that look like in your life? Oh, man. Um, He's asking hard questions. I know. These are some good questions. <laughs> um, well, you said deconstruct twice, and I love that word so much. So, anyways. Yeah, I mean, well, for me, um, I think one part of it is – wait – question review we're talking about deconstruction within faith or do you mean just like how have i what have i had to deconstruct in order to get to where Both. i am the bigger Both. the bigger word yeah my piece was about faith i'm just fascinating with that use of that word and that you're using that, yeah and how it applies to you yeah i mean well when you're when you're younger you're kind of growing up and you're kind of like learning the rules you're learning what is socially yeah. acceptable we're always taking like notes mentally I think of like what kind of behavior is rewarded or not rewarded or how do you receive love how um, are you supposed to give love and um, I don't know everything from like being a woman um, I think that's that's one thing like my place in in the world as a woman um, yeah. at, you know looking at because I think queer people like too like if you're more masculine, you have to be butch. If you're more feminine, you have to be femme. Um, there are so many deconstructions even within the LGBT community that you kind of have to like break down in order to just like fully embrace yourself. And I think that that's really what it, what it has been. It's been breaking down gender. It's been breaking down um, like what the voice is in my head. Is it just God or is there a, a higher self that I need to connect with as well? Um, like, it's just one thing after another, the patriarchy, the, you know, all the things. It's just like, you really have to um, comprehend what is going on around you and, and what kind of like the patterns are um, in society and even yep, in your yep, own behavior. Yep. And taking the time to step back and really observe that and understand how it affects you, um, if it's pushing you towards your purpose or if it's pulling you you know, to a place of shame. Um, I think mm -hmm. that that balance is something that I've spent my whole life teetering between and it, and it kind of seeps into all of the different areas of my life and who yeah. I am. Yeah. Now that makes me think of like deconstructing uh, gender when you said that. I love that, you know, because it's sort of the beauty of why I think a lot of LGBTQ people are pretty freaking amazing people because we don't have the luxury of the common rules applying in a lot of areas, whether it's faith or gender or what have you. So I had to rip down, what does it mean to be a man and rise back up to being a glorious exactly. man, even though I didn't yes. fit all the stereotypes, you know what I mean? So that's, that's good stuff. I love that. I love that. That's awesome, Bri. Yeah, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we're at 8.30. Do we wrap it up? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of, I, I have a lot of questions here. Someone wants to know, what are your musical influences, Abby? Abby, Me. ooh, okay. Um, gosh, love Maggie Gal, Maggie Rogers. She's great. Um, <laughs> I'm a huge Ben Howard fan. Yeah. Um, Leon lately. Um, Haim, yeah, I love Haim. Um, I don't know. I I like a lot of things. You can find you can find my Spotify playlists. I just learned that you can follow people and listen to it. So if you look up Abby, Abby Friends on Spotify, Spotify, I have tons of playlists. Yeah, yeah, you can check out what artists I like. Um, but it's like that sort of like indie, alternative, sometimes hip hop vibe. I love good yeah. production. So yeah, yeah, that's good. All right. Well, on that note, any any famous any famous last words? That you like? No, we just we love we love you and we love um, your community that you're building there. And we're so glad that you invited us to be a part of it. And, yeah, um, so much. And next time we're we're just gonna we're both just gonna fly to Atlanta, Brian. And we're gonna do a concert at your loft. <laughs> yeah, yo, I've got a okay. I got a big I got a big new home now, so I, we could like really? social distance and still get 30 people in there. Okay, <laughs> sweet. Do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you, thank you guys. Such good stuff. And this is kind of the best part right here. It's so good to finally meet you, Abby, Me and too. just kind of flesh it all out. And uh, yeah. proud of you both. Thank you all.
just a, a little quickie, this stream becomes a video. So anybody, if you want to go back, if you miss some stuff, or if you want to share it with somebody that needs to kind of hear what they sang and what they talked about, uh, that'll be available at our YouTube page. And that's all we got. That's a wrap. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, guys. Love you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Peace Bye. out. <laughs>